back. And if you're joining us now, we're just getting our third segment started. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to uh, bring in our third planned guest. Uh, but uh, shortly before the break, we were speaking with uh, Dr. Fernando Cuellar um, about a range of health-related issues. And of course, our focus shifted back to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you're following international news, you'll know that the situations do vary country to country. We are grateful that we are managing our situation pretty well here in Belize for the time being. Uh, but there is a great international spotlight on what is happening in India at the moment. And um, India has been struggling with a surge of COVID-19 infections and deaths. Uh, for the past few weeks and it has been really um, heartbreaking to hear about um, uh, the situation that has been happening there um, you know for the past month or so mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely and they are recording historic numbers of new cases and an alarming number of deaths and so uh, we'll actually give you a clip from uh, an, an international news broadcast it's PBS NewsHour and this is taking a look at the crisis in India. In India is relentless and appears to be only worsening. As death tolls and infections skyrocket, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is under increasing political pressure. William Brangham reports. This horrible sight is repeated across New Delhi today. Crematoriums running out of space for the victims of this virus. Many grieving families are told to just wait in line. People have to wait for at least five to seven hours before getting a chance to cremate the bodies. Although, as you can see, the bodies are being cremated rapidly, there's still a long queue of ambulances carrying bodies of COVID-19 victims outside the crematorium. India reported 3,400 official COVID deaths yesterday and nearly 370,000 infections. It was 400,000 last Friday. But experts believe all these numbers are likely a vast underestimate of the true severity of this crisis. Widespread shortages of COVID tests and the numbers of cremated bodies have added to the discrepancies. The impact the coronavirus is having has created a horrific reality for many in India. Several hospitals still lack enough oxygen to treat patients, leaving families to look after the sick on their own. We came twice, but they said home isolation is enough and sent us back. He was fine, recovered 75%. If oxygen was available, he would have survived. But without oxygen last night, he died. Now, makeshift solutions are required to treat the growing numbers of the suffering. Ambulances line up outside a hospital, waiting for precious beds to open. Old train cars are transformed into isolation rooms for the infected. Amid the crisis, though, there are glimmers of hope. Shipments of relief supplies, everything from oxygen to protective gear, arrived from Italy, the UK, and Germany today. And vaccination efforts are starting to ramp up. Schools are being turned into makeshift vaccination centers. But to date, just 2% of adults have been vaccinated in this country of 1.3 billion people. Across Delhi, we have started a mass vaccination drive for those aged 18 to 44 years. It's the first day today. We will take it further. Our target is to have at least 10 such centers at every school, and slowly we will increase it to 300 schools. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his political party suffered a major blow yesterday after losing regional elections in West Bengal, a clear sign that Modi's political reputation is being tested. Over the years, Modi has deployed Hindu nationalist rhetoric and nationalist policies that have raised his popularity and transformed India's politics. But his version of nationalism has bitterly divided Hindus from other ethnic groups in India. His refusal to stop holding large campaign rallies and to allow a huge Hindu religious festival are believed to be major contributors to this spike. And now, as a new, highly contagious variant has emerged in the country, Modi has resisted calls for any further lockdowns. I am joined now by someone who has been covering India's pandemic from the very beginning. Barka Dutt is a journalist based in New Delhi. Her work appears in many places, including the Washington Post. 
Barca Dutt, thank you very much for talking with us on the news hour. Um, first off, I should say you lost your father last week to this coronavirus, and I'm terribly sorry about your loss and especially grateful for you taking the time to talk with us. Um, could you just give us a sense of the latest of what you've been seeing on the ground there? In some ways, it's been a surreal week because 15 months of my journalistic life have been spent reporting this pandemic. And when the news came home, when I lost my dad, in some ways I became every desolate family that I have reported on outside of hospital doors that are too overrun to make space for patients or cremation grounds that have run out of spaces. That having been said, I do want to underline that even in this moment of deep personal loss, I am aware that I have been luckier than most of my countrymen and women. However, when I look at what's happening on the streets of my country in the major cities, most Indians are not able to get a bed. They're not able to get a doctor. And if they do get a hospital bed, they are dying in hospital because of a murderous disruption in oxygen supply to our health facilities. So what we're seeing is, in the words of one doctor, uh, healthcare workers who have been sent in to fight a nuclear war with a stick. It has been a monumental betrayal. It has been a monumental failure of policy. It has been a monumental illustration of misjudgment. And it has been a monumental absence of pre preparing for the second wave. We mentioned how uh, Prime Minister Modi has certainly seen his reputation badly dented because of this. And, and as we reported, he took a, a pretty bad beating in the in the state elections in West Bengal. Is it your sense that, that 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 election and people's discontent is a real reflection on him and his failures here? You know, uh, just because I'm um, a hardened journalist, I don't draw quick political conclusions. I know a lot of people have wanted to see in that result uh, some sort of comeuppance for the policy failures that have brought our country to this pass. I don't know, because this was a state election. The national election, which will decide the fate of Prime Minister Modi, is still three years away. Public memory is short. But what I can confirm is that pain and helplessness among people is turning to rage. Any number of people on the streets that I meet and interview with say, what did we vote for you for? And I think a lot of people are asking the following questions. Why did India gift away or export vaccines before it had enough for its own people? Why did India not order more vaccines? Why did the government continue to hold, including by the prime minister and the home minister, mammoth political rallies through the past month that this carnage has been unleashed on our people? There has been a flip and a turnaround on almost all of these decisions, but it's too late. And experts are telling me that there are not enough vaccines to take India out of the second wave. It's almost as if we have no choice but to live through the carnage. So, yes, I think people are angry. I know the Indian Supreme Court ruled recently that, that the government ought to reimpose some strict lockdowns, which, which we know caused incredible economic pain in India the first time around at the beginning of the year. Do you think that that's likely? Do you think the government will take that step to try to, to put this fire out? I think that although the government uh, was against a national lockdown, and I can actually see the, the logic for that because we are such a big, diverse country, that, that maybe a one-size-fits-all formula doesn't work. I think we're now at such a cataclysmic inflection point that, that even those of us who've been critical of lockdowns uh, are probably going to say you have no option. But a lockdown, if it's not accompanied by vaccines, William, is meaningless. And no matter which city I travel to, sometimes the gap between what the official data is reporting that day and what I'm physically counting myself is four times. If, as you say, the numbers are being seriously undercounted, is that is that an administrative failure or do you think it's something more uh, overt that they're trying to keep the numbers low? I think at every level there is some attempt, uh, a clumsy attempt to contain panic by keeping numbers relatively down. For example, uh, a major doctor who owns uh, laboratories that does RT-PCR testing for COVID told me that the moment his laboratories start uh, returning results, uh, which are very high, which reflect a very high positivity rate, he actually gets calls, he didn't name from whom, but he said from powerful people asking him to slow it down. This is on record to me in an interview. 
when it comes to uh, fatalities, one of the things that's happening is uh, not everybody is going to get a death certificate. Not everybody is getting a COVID test run uh, once somebody has died. And I've also met extremely poor people who can't even find an ambulance to ferry the dead to crematoriums. So I think it's fair to say that we're certainly not counting all of our dead. Uh, an undertaker at one crematorium in Delhi told me that at the peak of the first wave in 2020, he was cremating 30 bodies at his site in Delhi, and now he's cremating over 100 every night through this past week, when Delhi's overall figures, for example, reflect an implausible 400 for the entire city. So those are the kind of gaps we are seeing. Some of it, I would say, deliberate, some of it clumsy, some of it incompetence, and some of it just slipping through the cracks. Even if you had enough vaccine for everyone in the country, those take a good deal of time to both be distributed and to get into people, as well as take weeks to start taking effect. So, I mean, there's still, it sounds like, worse to come for you all. Well, you know, William, even speaking about my own father, my father had one jab, and I keep thinking if the vaccine program had rolled out earlier, if he'd had vaccines earlier, maybe if he'd had a second jab, maybe, just maybe something would have worked out differently. Our vaccination rates are among the lowest they've been this in this week at a point when we needed them to be the highest. So yes, I think there's no easy way to say this, that vaccines are over as a way out for us out of this pandemic. Vaccine manufacturers in India have told us that shortages will continue through July. The only thing that can save some lives is a steady supply of high flow oxygen. And for reasons that the government cannot explain to us, we are not receiving that at all of our hospitals. And so this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis unfolding here in my country. Barka Dutt in Delhi, thank you very much for being here. And again, I'm deeply sorry about the loss of your father. There you have it, putting it into perspective, you know. Um, yes, I know, I mean, really um, heartbreaking yeah. uh, from India yeah. and it's, of course, a reminder uh, to us about all of the importance of uh, not only following all of the directives when it comes to you know our social distancing and and hand washing, um, but um, it also drives home the point of I think how important it is, or you know, the effect and how significant. Uh, the vaccine rollout has been since the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm speaking, you know, internationally here. Yeah. And um, well, we did get 25,000 from India. Yes. Yeah. And um, you know, we're fortunate that um, you know our rate, our, our rate of vaccination has been a bit has been higher, and we are now uh, starting to have uh, those with their second doses already, yeah, as we spoke to Dr. You know, we spoke to Dr. Koyar. Uh, just now who is now fully vaccinated and um, you know what at the end of the day what uh, we are trying to or what you know this is sort of the worst case scenario right that we want to avoid and when we think about a country like Belize um, we don't have the resources to manage uh, a, a huge outbreak yeah. And we saw, you know, back in November and December of last year, when we were sort of on the verge of um, reaching that limit, um, how, you know, the cries from the medical community, um, because, you know, we didn't want to end up in a situation like this where, you know, uh, you know people were dying and at, at rates that, you know, we couldn't even manage. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's important that we take a look at what's happening in India. This is the worst outbreak recorded in this entire pandemic. The number of new cases, the number of new deaths, and we hope that there are lessons learned from it uh, as they continue to try to find their way. I mean, it was such a sobering point that you made in the end, that vaccination is not going to mm -hmm. be the end of their outbreak because simply the manufacturers are just saying they don't have enough. And uh, they're now relying on some of the, the very same protocols. And of course, oxygen, because yeah. that, that's a huge part of why they have the loss of life. I don't want to miss that in, in factoring in. But it's also uh, the lack of medical oxygen that's available yeah. there as well. Uh, the point, though, is that where we start to get comfortable here um, with how we're moving around and feeling safe, uh, we are never quite out of the woods. We are still very much living in a pandemic, and we must always keep that in perspective. Uh, remember that uh, you can get vaccinated. 
there are uh, the clinics are still uh, rolling out the vaccination program. There's an app that you can register to be able to get your vaccination. Um, take advantage of it. It's it's really important uh, that we all protect ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think that you know as we move through the different stages of this and as things sort of gradually open up with um, the increased numbers of uh, vaccinated persons, uh, it's still a reminder that we can never fully let our guard down. Yeah. So that, you know, even if we do have opportunities to, um, you know, go to larger gatherings or, you know, yeah. um, socialize, um, still yeah. be smart about it. Uh, because as we know, the vaccines aren't, doesn't mean the end of COVID. Yeah. So we still have to take responsibility for ourselves and uh, for those around us. So um, with that said, uh, we are going to be taking our final break. And when we come back, we are going to have our wrap up. So please stay tuned. Hola Tony. Hey Kevin, ¿qué onda? ¿Qué pasa? Nada, le vine a buscar porque necesito comprar más mercancías de vasos y platos desechables para mi tienda de comestible. Me estoy quedando sin esas cosas. No hombre, fíjate que desde el 15 de abril no puedo importar nada de eso y se me acaba de terminar todo lo que tenía hace como tres semanas. Oye, pero nunca has estado sin esas cosas. ¿Qué está pasando? Mira esto. Esta es la nueva ley que prohíbe todo el uso de plásticos no reutilizables. Esos son vasos, platos, cucharas, tenedores, todo eso. Desde 15 de abril de este año, no he podido importar nada de eso. A partir del 15 de enero del 2021, nadie puede fabricarlo. 15 de abril 2021, nadie lo puede vender. Y a partir del 14 de julio del 2021, si alguien te agarra con eso, te multan. Híjole, no sabía eso. Necesito cambiar algunas cosas. Les diré a mis clientes por qué esas cosas ya no están disponibles. Gracias, Antonio. Así es. Cuídate, Dani. If we are only as strong as our families, businesses, institutions, and the communities that surround us, then by giving businesses the power to grow, entrepreneurs the ability to expand and by giving our families the right to own something the belize bank gives you the power to build a nation our nation That with Smart, you get truly unlimited everything. Only with Smart, you get unlimited data anytime. While with the other guy, it's only double data on weekends. With unlimited data every day with Smart, there's no need to wait. So, it's a fact that our unlimited plans beat the competition. Stop being measured and told when to use your data and get unlimited talk, text, and data. Experience the true, true unlimited plans with Smart. That's a fact. Make the switch and live smart. Yep. Uh, we're just getting our show wrapped up this morning. Uh, we want to say thank you to all our guests. Uh, for coming in. Of course, we had our first conversation with uh, the Honorable Dolores Valderamos Garcia, who is Minister of Human Development, um, Families and Indigenous Affairs, and she's giving us an update on her various ministries. Mm -hmm. And um, so we want to say thank you to her, um, as well as uh, Dr. Fernando Cuellar, who um, came in to give us a timely reminder of, of how to protect yourself in these uh, really hot times. Yeah, stay hydrated, check on uh, your loved ones. And he brought up a really critical point, which is even if they are indoors, you still have to check on them because it can still be a situation where they're suffering from heat-related illnesses. 
Uh, it starts with uh, dehydration, uh, tiredness, sometimes slur, and it can actually reach to the point where they get develop heat strokes. Uh, he's already seen people coming into the hospital, into, his, into their clinic um, with uh, heat-related illnesses. So please uh, take every precaution and uh, make sure you protect yourself. It's over 100 today inland, and we only expect it to get hotter in the weeks ahead. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, and of course, you know, we, were dis we rounded off our show by a discussion about some international news. Of course, we looked at uh, the unfortunate COVID situation in India, but of course, they're not alone. There are also other countries, even, you know, closer to our neck of the woods, which are experiencing, yeah. you know, some major issues with um, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, of course, um, regionally speaking, some of the examples that come to mind, uh, Jamaica wasn't doing well. Trinidad that and Tobago has also had a um, huge increase in numbers and they actual, uh, their Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley announced yesterday that they were going into a 10-day lockdown uh, to manage some of the significant uh, uh, increase in numbers that um, Trinidad and Tobago has been experiencing. Um, of course, we've been looking at situations in Mexico, Guatemala, countries that are um, near to us, and all of this is a reminder that we are not out of the pandemic. Uh, please, you know, uh, we always say it, but um, take responsibility and adhere to all of the uh, protocols um, issued by the Ministry of Health, even if you are partially vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. Don't let your guard down. That's the commitment we have to make to each other. But that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to contact us, send us an email, oie at channel5police.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Open Your Eyes BZ. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at OIE Belize. And uh, remember to tune in tomorrow morning at 6.30 when you open your eyes. Start your morning right. Until then, keep your eyes, your mind, and your heart open. We'll see you soon. Enjoy your day. Open Your Eyes was brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank.